That's good timing. I apologize for the, the ding in public. Uh, yesterday, I, yesterday I, I was hit by a dagger. Actually, I was hit by a tanto, which is a wooden pretend dagger in practice when uh, my, our sensei and I misunderstood each other and I walked under the dagger as it was coming down when I wasn't supposed to. Okay, sorry, I, I, I only listened to you like a little bit. So you were hit by a, a dagger. Yes. But you're okay. I'm just fine. It was a wooden, okay. it's called a tanto. Aikido has three weapons. It has a dagger, a sword, and a stick. The, the tanto, the boken, and the jo. And okay. I didn't used to like weapons practice, and now I really do, because there's like, especially the jo, the stick, it's like as tall as your armpit if you're standing. It's so cool, the stuff you can do with a stick. It's just so cool. And there's throws, there's a whole bunch of really fun things. And, and uh, so anyway, we were doing practice and I, I got whacked on the forehead. Other than that, I'm good. How about you all? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I go out. Kind of okay, yes. Uh, Are you feeling I mean, better? I had a weird day, like, uh, you know, I'm an, an SRE, reliability engineer. And today, like we have like a global outage for a feature for the last four hours, so yeah, like uh, excitement. This is I'm always torn though because you know there's uh, different kinds of injuries and like I sort of like like incidents, you know, the excitement of being like 30 people in a room like trying to figure something out. Yeah, but, although they are very tiring. Uh, so I, I feel a bit guilty sometimes. Even it's like oh that was cool, but um, we shouldn't do that again actually. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, is that, uh, that uh, so my, my dagger took the shape of like a, a an outage today. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, but that was pretty fine. A long time ago, in the beginning of my tech career, I had something that was sort of similar, but not nearly as intense. It was basically our clients could call up with questions at any time, and then we would have to answer mm -hmm. those. And some of those were more urgent than others, but it wasn't like a team exercise where right this minute we have to fix something because something is broken. It was, it was never that. So. Yeah, Aram, uh, I, the same thing here. I just opened up the chat and I was like, oh, wait, there's stuff here from before I got in. It's nice. I'm glad I'm glad that Jitsi has one thing I like better than. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I worked on a Reddit project and like PMs were like showing people what happened before they join. Are you crazy, essentially? <laughs> but it has a lot of advantages, right? For exactly. Exactly. And I'm uh, at the top of the hour, I'm expecting someone to show up that I will need to bounce to. So I may have to leave at the hour. Cool, cool. Um, but there we are. Um, uh, things that are on people's minds. Um, I guess uh, planning for the year, I'm still uh, following on that thread. Uh, so I guess individually and as a fellowship. Yep. Um, to which, um, this is sort of my plan for the year. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of locking it down now, but, um, I'm trying to be a little more organized in the way too many things that I want to get done and want to do. And also a little more action oriented about not just wanting to do things, but trying to get them done. Um, so so yeah, so that that's, so I'm very interested in how that fits into what anybody else is doing. Pete and I are already uh, collaborating on different parts of it, and some parts of it involve upgrades to uh, Massive Wiki. Uh, Bentley, you've already done some things that fit in here, like the the presentation, the Neo Neo Deck or whatever I call it in that list. Uh, we've already started working on, and this just means how do we push those things further along, and uh, possibly get funding for more. Uh, open source modules and stuff. Very nice. Yeah, so I took a, a, short, a short look, but I haven't read recursively still, which is like part of the charm of that list. Um, and yeah, of course, I, I'm particularly interested in like share notes across tools. Uh, you're one of the you're one of the people in that list. So yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I've done some some slight progress uh, this week. Uh, not enough to sh showcase something, but hopefully we can shoot for like next meeting if people are interested, like to show something just quickly. Cool. I can, can do that. 
uh, and uh, I guess also uh, oh, there was something else. Oh yeah, uh, pattern languages. I guess, uh, but uh, I guess I don't know. Like nothing specific right now, except for let's do more of those. I guess, <laughs> but like uh, maybe I you know uh, how to apply pattern languages to the other projects. I guess how they interact. Um, I should, I should. I don't think I've put much on that page yet, except for here's some pattern languages that exist. But there's a a couple different angles to that. One of them is, you know, the uh, Pyragogic pattern language community is alive and well right now, and they're I'm on their I'm on their list, so I see some of their traffic. Um, others are less lively, but that they have bodies of work that not enough people know about. So a piece of this is just that that instrumenting. A second piece of it is how might we create some pattern languages and. Pete, were you in the pattern language workshop like a year ago during pandemic with me? No. Yeah. Well, in the OGM one or? No, there was a pattern language workshop that some pattern language builders, I, I can find who it was. I, it sounds familiar. I, I think I might have been. Um, I'm going to raise my hand on the same topic, but okay. I, I can. Um, anyway, so I, I was uh, I did a workshop on writing pattern languages. So the second piece of it is about hey, are there pattern languages that we could create around the things that we care about here collectively, uh, which could be around tools for thinking, could be around open content, could be around anything. And then third is what I was awkwardly calling instrumenting or maybe activating or whatever the right word is uh, patterns within pattern languages, which means some of them are very amenable to turning into code as an assistant uh, or something else to, to make them super easier to implement. And the example I use here is from liberating structures, the, the pattern language about facilitation. There's the pattern one, two, four, all, which uh, basically involves some choreography. Wouldn't it be cool if that was a zoom app? And uh, wouldn't it be cool if there was even a meta facilitation bot that you could plug into Zoom? So as a junior facilitator, you could confer with a greater intel collective intelligence housed in the pattern that would then say, hey, it looks like you could use one, two, four, all right now. Would you like me to help you do it? <clears throat> and then if you said yes, then the software would break people up into the right number of, of breakouts, name the breakouts, put prompts in the chat, do f several other goodies. You know, since, since it's software, you could do a whole bunch of really cool stuff. Anyway, that's, that's one example with one, one pattern in one pattern language. I think there's a bunch of other things like that that are low-hanging fruit to turn into useful tools to level up everybody's game, facilitating, designing cities, buildings, what, what have you. Mm. And I think that chain is interesting from, hey, here's some distilled wisdom, to, hey, here's a pattern, to, hey, here's a, a, a link to, to reality back where people could use and, and apply that pattern. And if anybody thinks of a better name than instrumentation, tell me now. Because I know that instrumentation in the software world typically means adding uh, adding triggers and other things to your code so yeah. that you can actually troubleshoot, right? So that you can debug. And that's yeah, not cool. and that's not mm -hmm. at all what I'm what I mean by the term. So I'm I'm borrowing poorly. Yeah, I mean uh, it goes with oper operationalizing. That's not bad. I did I pronounce that right? No. Yeah, probably not. so my difficulty probably is, it says that it's not the best name. <laughs> but yeah, something yeah. like this. But uh, I think it also like um, I mean with, with that caveat of the of the different evolution uh, in software, well, it, it did give a, an okay idea, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think all that. Yeah, I mean just uh, uh, as well in like, you know, I guess conventions to communicate patterns, like uh, patterns for <laughs> for like communicating patterns. So I, I think of the wiki link as a um, as, as a pattern, I guess, right? And like uh, like that, you know, like textual patterns, I guess, uh, and how they can encode relations, for example. This is something that uh, I will be interested in discussing also in the context of, of massive wiki, uh, you know, and, and the hour, of course, like for example, like how do you say this entity has to do with this one, right? In uh, using wiki links and arrows or you know like a, like a visual language to some extent uh, yeah 
and there could be patterns for how to use hashtags well, uh, you know, yes. basically meta metadata, meta tagging. There could be a bunch of interesting patterns in our space. So, <clears throat> so maybe a thing for us to do is to keep that keep that loop going in the background so that we, as as things pop up, we're like, oh, that could be a pattern candidate. Right. Yes. And then it would be great if there was a page that we shared that was like, hey, pattern candidate ideas, where we could just drop that and all know that we'd put something there. It does seem like the perfect use case for a wiki where we can talk about it and have a bunch of options. And Don't it? So, so I will start. Yeah. I will start a page like that uh, in the Relate Wiki uh, and share that back on the uh, FOTL uh, Matter uh, channel on Mattermost. Mm -hmm. So I can do that. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll go. Um, I've got a friend, uh, let me make a new, new level here. Yeah, that's even better. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I've got a friend, uh, John Abbey, uh, who's an, an old wiki person like me. Um, mm. Um, so, uh, I think this is going to be a massive wiki. Um, it, it's currently a massive wiki and, um, uh, we, we kind of know what it's, it, it's starting to come into focus, what it's about. Um, uh, so, um, uh, what it's about is going to be between a couple different things, uh, including pattern languages, systems, maybe quality without a name, um, mm. somewhere around there, maybe a, a few more things. So I'll put a page, uh, notes page from yesterday. Um, and right now it doesn't have a web version um, most massive wikis have a web version and a and a git version uh, we're starting this one on codeberg instead of github uh, because we want to start moving away from github um, but our standard web publishing system doesn't integrate automatically with uh, codeberg just github and gitlab and and um, bitbucket um, so I, I think it's kind of too early to, I, I, because we mentioned pattern languages, I, I wanted to mention, you know, that superliminal is kind of coming into focus. Um, it's a little bit too early to, to say much more or do much more than that. Um, unless folks want to hack around with a massive wiki with us. Um, uh one of the one of the concerns that john has actually is that massive wiki is still hard to adopt it's still hard to onboard um uh, getting the the authentication and the git stuff set up um it's it's not it's a small number of things but they're still technical um so you kind of need a technical guide to get you over you know 15 minutes of stuff 10 minutes of stuff um Yes. Sorry. Um, so, have you thought? I don't know how this deployment uh, of a new massive wiki works like. Do you have like a Docker something <laughs> like Docker file? It's. Or isn't that uh, right? You don't need any software actually. Um, like, or there's there's no um, the mm -hmm. the the hard. Right now, we we kind of rely on Git, um, and for anybody who uses Git. It's like, oh, it's easy. You know, why is that a, a blocker? Right. Um, for mm, a person who's never used Git, for a person who's not a developer, who doesn't have un any understanding of uh, revisions control systems and stuff like that. And for somebody like Git itself is not well packaged. Um, so there are packagings of it. You know, there are developer friendly ways to bootstrap git on your machine but they're developer friendly and they're not you know muggle friendly um and and it's not it's not a big deal even it's not uh you know it's 
I guess we're still kind of trying to, to sort out what's the, the most easy way to do it um, or the, the least scary way to do it, um, which are actually two different things kind of. Um, uh, and then we can still run in, new users can still run into to gotchas. Um, so we haven't characterized all of those and, and resolved all of them. I have to say this is very much precisely what also um, affects the hour, right? Because it's also the yeah. place, and I think we share that completely. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. So, so this is like the, I guess, on the Git hosting side, or like, you know, spin up a box that has like a massive wiki editing AI UI. Do you have an editing UI, or is it a another another odd thing about massive wiki is um, we are. T uh, we are notionally uh, tool agnostic. Um, in practice, it turns out that we're all using Obsidian. Um, uh, so, so that's a, another thing. Um, so, so another another thing that's unique to Massive Wiki is like we actually don't care what tool you use. Here's a list of tools that you could use, and that's not very friendly for uh, a new. Wait, user. First of all, like, it's very funny because. Um, it's not unique because everything you're saying applies to the Agora. <laughs> yeah. Agora and, uh, and Massive Wiki are yeah, yeah, yeah. this far so I, But this is a great opportunity. I mean, I'm just very excited because uh, it seems like, uh, you know, uh, going at it from the, uh, the angle of patterns or otherwise, we probably could identify like one or two things we could work out uh, on together. And like, it will just be perfect alignment, honestly. Yeah, yeah. 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 That would be lovely. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, to to address the Git thing real quick, um, mm -hmm. and maybe the Obsidian thing real quick. One of the things with Obsidian is it's it's becoming this beautiful ecosystem for PKM, um, and every time it gets a little bit more complex, it gets less user friendly, and it makes makes me really sad. Um, I mean, I'm I'm really happy as an Obsidian user, and it's really frustrating to see it any tiny bit of complexity added to it because it's already a complex tool. Um, uh, and it's it's really it's it's getting to the point where it's not fit for you know non non technical PKM users. Unless you're doing PKM and you want to sit down and learn Obsidian for a couple of weeks with Nick Milo or or whoever, you know, <laughs> Obsidian is hard to use. Um, so anyway, I, I have a, a a dream system thing you know written down on roadmaps uh it's called opal um and opal Google? with opal uh o-p-a-l um uh kind of like obsidian but different um so uh the idea with, with opal is it's kind of like obsidian but much simpler it doesn't do much that obsidian does um and it has uh it would have uh Git built into it. Um, there's a JavaScript Git um, Git library that you know all all JavaScript Git library. So oh, I was yeah, like, yeah. make an Atom app. That, Git. Uh, yeah, that sounds right. So make a you know make an Atom uh, Electron app um, uh, that um, you know that has some simple editing and has JavaScript Git built into it, and you just download it and run it. Um, so. Um, Aram, is it okay if I, I I have one or two more bullets, um, or do, do you want to jump in? Um, I had a, I had a, a comment on what you just said, but it can wait. Uh, so so anyway, um, I was I John John had a little bit of a biased view of um, Massive Wiki coming into it uh, because I know that he used to be a developer. He's kind of moved away from being a developer. But he knows he knows how tech works, so I thought I would take him the faster but scarier uh, route to setting up Massive Wiki, and and after that he's like, okay, Pete, this is too scary for my non-technical friends um, who we might want in Superliminal. So I, I spoiled him a little bit, or or spoiled something. But anyway. In the conversation with John and me, I came up with an interesting idea for a Massive Wiki. Um, uh, massive has an old um, acronym that that the word Massive comes from. Um, and I'm going to try to hit return. 
here at the right. Uh, original. The original acronym is um, uh, M A S V F. Um, markdown shared version files. This this ends up ended up being you know this was the original organizing principle of Massive Wiki. Um, uh and each of those is important and and it it has uh stood the test of time um uh, well um uh so i was like you know what if we told new users who who we didn't want to like let on that that git was the way that we share in version files what if we just told them you need to learn how to edit a market markdown file, but that's pretty easy. And then why don't we just send emails back and forth to each other with markdown files as attachments? <laughs> Which I know sounds insane to anybody who's gotten themselves out of that rat race, but it's like, you know, that's kind of a lingua franca. Can you send an email? Yeah, I can send an email. Can yes. you send an attachment? 80% of the time, I think I can send an attachment and get it back out. So it's like, OK, so let's play this game called Massive Wiki uh, by email. Um, I'm going to send you a couple files uh, as markdown attachments, save them to a directory, and then maybe you'll make some new files and send them back as attachments. Um, let's, let's agree to a couple rules. One of the rules is we're using markdown. One of the rules is the top line should be uh, uh, a single hash and the title of, of what you want to call this file. And let's have a rule where we do wiki links, this thing called wiki links with, um, uh, I don't know, Bengal. Uh, let's do wiki links with double square brackets. And that's, that's all the rules that we need, right? And then you're basically playing massive wiki. Um, it's clunky. It's not using Git. Uh, the version control management is probably, you know, copy of 002, you know, dash edited by Pete and Flancy and, you know, on, but whatever, you know, <laughs> so, you know, that's totally yeah. awesome. I, I think, you know, the, I, the email uh, aspect is really like, uh, oh, sorry, no, I don't want to go, to go with, uh, with, um, uh, before Adam. Sorry, Adam. Oh, yeah, I think the email aspect is really interesting, oh, too. This is entirely oh. different from what I was going to say earlier. I actually think like the occurrence of newsletters is sort of this weird return to people being massively engaged in email that necessitates the idea of approaching like some new email tools. There's a really good article that uh, like slipped by me in the Twitter feed before I could click on it. And all I could see was the headline, but the headline was basically like, we're all using email tools that basically were invented in the nineties and haven't significantly changed since then. And what does that mean? And so I think this is really interesting because the idea of emailing each other markdown files sort of dovetails into like a workflow that I've been working on about this, which is it's very easy to set up um, infrastructure, server infrastructure to process emails and do stuff with them. Like it'd be very easy to imagine yes. you and somebody else emailing back and forth, CCing an address that lives on AWS or Google or Microsoft yep. infrastructure and then having it write the mass of wiki files without you ever having to do a commit yourself or anything like that. And that sort of thing is like a service that makes up a product that could be very useful to people and is relatively cheap. I have a, um, what is my, I think I've shown this before, but I think Backreads um, is currently processing some ludicrous number of emails every day now. Yeah, like around, 233 to 250 emails a day with additionally processing around three to 4,000 links, depending on the day, each of which get archived in AWS and crawl, crawled and archived in AWS. And the total cost for that's like under $5 a month. Um, like it would be very easy to set up a flow for this cheaply and scale it out as tooling for other people to adopt. Yes. That'd be really interesting. Completely, and like I, I, I actually really wanted to develop like uh, this for the Agora this year, which would be like you see an Agora and say like a node, which is a context, anything you want to tag, at an Agora, and it just gets ingested into the node. It's very, very, very simple to develop. 
Um, and like you say, it's like, you know, available anywhere and like uh, sort of like easy to wrap your, your head around, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I think that two links in chat. Um, somebody's doing this with Obsidian, actually. Um, IFTTT and Integromat have email, you know, email capture. Nice. Yeah, and I think like that ties into a really interesting idea based on what you were saying, Francine, which is like you can, one of the other things I'm playing with more as a privacy thing is it is fairly easy to set up like regex style rules on email. So you could have email rules where it's like you email to a note or to a page pretty easily as part of that process without having to put that in the text of the markdown file you're emailing or anywhere else. It's just whichever email you send it to on the domain. Right. Yeah. So like you get that um, free key, essentially. Or, uh, well, the, the question though at the end of the day is who are you gonna put the work on the end user who has to deal with the moving pieces or the developer who makes the system may be just as easy to give them a shadow GitHub account that they don't even know about and everything they're doing is saved there. They don't have to do the work or think about it or do the back and forth or conflict issues. I mean, I've used a group Dropbox based version of an Obsidian vault. And there's two or three of us who go through and resolve conflicts because two people can edit at the same time and it just creates a conflict copy. And somebody has to go through and do a quick diff and check it and fix it, which is usually pretty easy. And it's not bad with 20 people using it but you scale that up to a couple thousand and you're going to run into an awful lot of overhead. Um, yeah. So it's really, that's the, it's a design decision of wh where are you going to put the work into it or who are you going to force to do the work? Yeah. So, I think like uh, the idea of like uh, providing like a simple to use interface to what is essentially backed by the same powerful repository, uh, the Git, Git back is, is very promising. And on the conflict resolution aspect, I think that's actually a very interesting topic if you think about it. Because like, in particular, if, it's, if what you're doing, imagine like CRDTs, you know, but for like this course, it's very, very, I think, uh, core to what we uh, keep discussing, I think. You know, to which extent could we problematically merge conflicts, preserving voices, for example. And you know, like uh, this is why I, I I'm so such a fan of outliner mode. If you think about the conflicts that you get in outliner mode, I, I think it can be seen, it can be shown that resolving the conflicts programmatically is easier than resolving conflicts for uh, general text because the hierarchy is very easy to parse. And usually, when if you say I'm gonna append one block to another in outliner mode, that's fine. It's not like very destructive. So you could imagine like uh, that being a key to like just making it very easy to resolve conflicts programmatically, which seems interesting. And of course, such an, such algorithms which could be hooked into Git in general. Say you know if the if you know how to resolve the conflict by uh, automatically, just do so and maybe send a notification. Could actually make the whole uh, problem space more accessible, like uh, you are hinting at. All right, Chris, if you ever wanted to share some of those, or I don't know if you've already blogged about them and I missed them, that'd be really interesting. I would add that like there is some interesting plugins in Obsidian for handling some of this stuff that uh, people have done work on, including like syncing with Git, which is theoretically useful. I mean, I'm the person who does development work all the time, so I prefer to do my Git work myself instead of using a plugin. But it's fairly high rated. And, People seem to like using it and keep recommending it. Uh, we use uh, Massive Wiki uses Obsidian Git a lot, mm -hmm. um, and it's it and it started off pretty creaky, but it's actually very nice now. Yeah. Um, uh, we're we're switching. The one thing that we still can't do in Obsidian Git, uh, it's actually got a very nice um, panel uh, that will let you do commits, and you know you you can stage in particular files and unstage them and diff them and it's actually very nice um it's it's almost as good as atom um 
uh, we were really scared. We were using Atom for some stuff, uh, and Atom got deprecated by Microsoft uh, at the end of last year. Um, it's been picked up by uh, an open source team, and it's called Pulsar now. Um, so uh, the thing that we can't do with Obsidian Git is branch management, um, and Pulsar does branch management too. So um, we're, we're excited about Pulsar, even though it's a little less friendly looking than Obsidian. You know, actually, my, uh, my civilian users have picked up Atom or Pulsar just as, as easily as Obsidian, and the Git stuff is actually easier to use um, in Pulsar. In that direction, there's foam. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I will call it easy to use, but you know, like I guess I haven't used Atom and Pulsar, but like uh, they, the, of course, the Git management of um, VS Code is is good. Yeah, I, I, I stay, try to stay away from VS Code, kind of for the same reasons I stay away from GitHub and, right. and uh, you know. Yeah, they're... no, I understand. Yeah, and I keep using it and it keeps crashing, and I'm like. You wrote, you wrote some contract, it seems, if the editor crashes, but okay, anyway. Yeah, I, you know, I, I had had this experience talking to somebody, you know, I was like, oh, we need to do Git branches, oh, we need to IDE, um, is, is what came out of my mouth, you know? And then it turns out that Atom is kind of an IDE, but it's actually more, it's a project-oriented uh, text editor with Git. It's actually really not an IDE. And then VS Code is an IDE, and it's got a bunch of stuff that a developer wants, and a bunch of stuff that you don't yeah. want mm -hmm. newbies to have to deal with. So Atom and, and Pulsar are are good for you know I, all I need to do is edit a bunch of files in in a directory and do Git with it. It's it's uh, yeah Atom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jerry got the right the right yeah. um, uh, address for Pulsar. Thank you. Uh, well, those are the same, aren't they, Jerry? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, my my copy paste didn't work the first yeah. first try, but it, but it was Adam.io. Then if you go to that site, it says, "Oops, we've deprecated at the end of 2022." And it doesn't give you any kind of pointer or trailer to Pulsar. But then if you search for if you Google for Pulsar and Adam, then you go directly to the Pulsar editor site. So, mm -hmm. so there we go. Um, so here I have a potential sidetrack. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. So uh, because I may I just make a connection, I don't know if it's uh, real, but here goes. So I was thinking of like how an ICD is a massive wiki is Git Markdown uh, base um, and the OS as well. And there's so much just like activity, even as a side effect of like the Cloud Sync feature, like of C and Git, like essentially yielding all these interesting a priori of C and bolts that are in Git because people use just that as an alternative to the hostel sync, right? Uh, very often, I think. So a lot of uh, uses of boarding uh, and taking notes in Git, right? And I, I'm thinking of the, you know, the commons like, like uh, could be defined as the, you know, the union of all, all uh, Git repositories that are compatible with the commons, right? Uh, in intent. And the question is how to discover it. So discoverability will be the heading of the section, right? Which goes to search, maybe. And it reminded me of this experiment I read about um, uh, earlier this week, just which seems slightly related with this. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Mastodon Search. Um, what yeah, what yeah. search? Mastodon Search. So Mastodon. Uh, uh, because, uh, you know, Yes, the, uh, so Mastodon search is uh, limited and doesn't work like people expect, and there's no way to search the Mastodon commons, actually the favorite commons, like uh, many Twitter users in particular will expect coming from a centralized service. And it's been it's proven very hard to build such a tool, not because technically it's very difficult, maybe the same as I will say applies to a bunch of his repos, which is like you know, there's nothing too complicated. We say like let's have a list with like 10 million repos, right? Uh, and, and, and you know, crawl it and integrate it, which is nice, right? It's, thankfully, it's easy, uh, presumably. But there's nothing complex about that technically, but the community is in general not in agreement with like people searching that commons, 
or, or, or providing an interface to search it. And yeah, so the math to search was this experiment. I don't want to go into details. Perhaps we can discuss. I, I, I should be in the hour. If not, it will be go linked in a, after the meeting. Math to search. The, the, a person did like a, a um, ethical experiment, saying like I'm gonna try to build a search engine for that is you know like reasonably opt in or opt out according to community preferences and lets people search timelines, right? And if they still run afoul of uh, of some community expectations. So they actually turn it, 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 turn it down. They're not running it anymore. But they said like they they actually provided like a nice post with like these are the requirements, the qualities that uh, such a tool will, will have to have in our opinion to do better. And I sort of think uh, and and they actually hint uh, just uh, Charlie Adam they hint at the, uh, as, as a, a particular risk, which is that so search and and discoverability of of Git repositories both. Uh, could provide a lot of value, right? It could be very useful. If there was one place where you can actually go and search and you find this, there will be uh, some network effects and potentially it will be very useful. And it only will take one bad actor or uh, defined just as someone who doesn't care strictly about like what the community thinks now to go and build it and make it useful to essentially maybe in the worst case, enclose the commons. And once that is in place, like people will just use it, and they will, it will, you know, benefit from the same network effects. And it seems like that problem space, both for like, you know, discovery and integration of like Git repositories uh, with information, and uh, the, the failures. It seems like both those spaces are open uh, as we enter 2023, which actually seems surprising to me, <laughs> even. And uh, so I, I wanted to bring that up because uh, you know it's just a, a particular parallel between uh, the favors and the knowledge commons, which may be the right the same thing by the way, <laughs> right? Uh, in, in the end, uh, and something that we could explore. Yeah, so that's uh, that's it. Yeah, I mean I think that this is a really interesting problem that Macedon is facing because the other side of that is there's also like. People who applied for and got special research from um, like Twitter to get the Twitter API for academic reasons. And one of the people who is writing a version of Mastod a Mastodon patch that allowed full search was like interested in that. And like that's a real need that people should be moving forward on. But yeah, there's a lot of danger there that the wrong person adopts it, I think. It does sort of speak to like the best defense, I think, to this is to like fragment search, not just as like a subject of search, but to make it easier and more effective for people to build general search engines and search corpuses. I think uh, I maintain a topic on this, and there's been more of this, and more of this keeps coming up. Uh, that has been really interesting to me because I think like these types of problems and these types of enclosures, search and indexing and crawling is the heavy duty problem that big entrants solve that allows them to do capture. Uh, and so solving that problem and making those tools available at a community level, I think is not the yes. solution, but a potential solution or part of it. Completely. Uh, I mean, uh, a lot of people, uh, it may be, right? I think like uh, a lot of people like said, you know, like opt-in doesn't work because, uh, well, uh, actually it doesn't work. <laughs> Usually most people don't opt-in. But like there's, for, for example, if you think about Mastodon, some instances could be opt-out, could say like we're actually uh, part of the commons by default. So, they, so, you know, like group level rules, you could say as well, Everything with a hashtag is uh, you need to opt out if you don't want it to be indexed, right? You could have like, and we go back to the patterns, right? Does a hashtag mean that you are contributing the post to, to the commons? It could mean that, right? But, uh, but uh, we have to have the conversation. Or, or, to, or you know, uh, and the, the commons being like any uh, provider or consumer, does, uh, you know, using Wikilinks, in a Git repository, uh, mean that you know if you have a, a compatible license file, that can be ingested by the Knowledge Commons, 
being like one based on Massey Wiki or, or, or an Agora or both, right? Uh, I'm biased, right? So I, I think that if we lower the, the, the barriers to coordination so that, you know, we can, without surprising people, reasonably like bootstrap knowledge commons and re bootstrap them in case they are enclosed, right? Uh, like easily and cheaply, I would rather go to that future, right? But I also don't want to be the person saying like, I'm gonna discover every repository uh, that exists that has Markdown and like put it in a knowledge commons. Well, or perhaps I do, I do want to do that, but I, I feel like I should, you know? Uh, because someone will do it. <laughs> right, and I think that it shouldn't be, a, a, it should be a, an ethical group. <laughs> Maybe one that meets on Wednesdays, I don't know. But you know, like what I mean, as in not a person, probably, because it's too much, you know. Um, uh, now, I don't know, whether well, this leads on to something uh, doable. It, it, it's funny, as, as we started this conversation, I was, I was thinking I'm not, I, I don't worry about the enclosure problem. Oh, interesting. Mm. But you've well, spoken because, with me about it, and it's, I thought it was one of the reasons you were trying to leave GitHub. Well, I, I worry about enclosure, but I don't worry about kind of you know the the default thing of math. Well, so I, I was I, I was starting to think that I, I didn't worry about the enclosure problem, um, and it's because I I sit in massive Wikiland kind of. Um, and the other, the other, the enclosure problem actually goes hand in hand with like um, search engines. Like in the olden days, we didn't have search engines, and then there was Archie, and you know, then there was Alta Vista, and then there was um, oh my God, uh, you know, Google. Um, uh, we like Google didn't have to be successful. Um, it was a two-way street, right? They made Google or they made Alta Vista. Um, and then people were like, this is much better than anything else. I'm just going to use it. So it was a voluntary enclosure. Um, and I feel like, you know, if, if you were careful enough, if the activists were careful enough to say, and it starts here, you know, it starts now, like you have to start thinking about it before it happens. I yeah. totally agree with that. But if you're careful enough to say, hey, you know, last time this happened, we ended up with Google and Google now owns all of your stuff, right? Maybe we shouldn't do that. You know, it's it's not like a, it's it's not the, I don't know. It, it's, it's, a, a, it's a codependent, um, uh, enclosure and maybe you know maybe we can teach people fast enough not to not to be part of it but but then i was like you know actually maybe i maybe massive wiki is actually an anti-enclosure strategy because one of the really interesting things about massive wiki is that as you put stuff in massive wikis you you start to not put it all in one massive wiki you put you know you you end up copying from one massive wiki to another and you end up kind of with a, a a database nerd's nightmare where it's like, guys, don't you have a, a authoritative version? And it's like, yeah, you know, <laughs> if you needed it, you made a copy of it. And if you made a copy of it, you can change it. And maybe you'd send it back and maybe you wouldn't, you know. So in a way, Massive Wiki is, is a little bit enclosure proof or enclosure resistant, at least, because you start making all of these, you know, yeah, sure. You could you could aggregate all of that, but somebody else can aggregate it in a little bit different way, and you can have competition amongst aggregation uh, strategies, and uh, you can have people that actually move their stuff out of maybe public aggregation and and go to some private aggregation that they they you know they participate in. It's a little bit not. I guess this kind of happens on the web, but I really like pushing the idea that. You know, no, there's not a, a canonical copy of it. And no, uh, you know, if you search for it, you're going to find the canonical copy. It's like, yeah, you know, search search in as many uh, search aggregators as you as you can 
and look for different versions of it. And that's the, the, the beauty of it. So Massive Wiki kind of pushes for uh, uh, an ecosystem of aggregators, not, not one super aggregator, I think. I, I wanted to mention Murmurations, by the way. Um, Murmurations is, a, is it, it was intended for profile person profile aggregation or that was their first uh their first application um uh they've they never intended it to be just people but you know people uh throw up a i guess it's probably a json throw up a, a json payload um and tell us about it and and we'll keep you know we'll we'll aggregate all these json chunks there's more to it than that it's not just a simple json aggregator um they've got some some thought thinking mm. too. Oh, I was going to hit return on this. Um, there's a few other people doing things like murmurations. Um, uh, and, and then this is a little bit like the old micro formats. Micro formats were a way of publishing information in, you know, HTML, um, in the, into mm -hmm. the interstices of HTML. And then the idea of micro formats was you've got aggregators that, that pull those together. So maybe that's my headline. Um, make sure that so don't don't tell people don't use an aggregator, but encourage an ecosystem of aggregators that are competing um, always. Yes, with a shared base layer, federation protocol, and so on. Yeah. yeah. What order our hands are in here? <clears throat> it doesn't have a queue. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's not really a queue. Uh, do you mind if I jump in? Um, so so I was just putting in the chat, uh, partly what Pete is talking about starts to turn the ground. I feel like I'm standing on into quicksand, which worries me a bunch. Uh, I have enough trouble mapping uh, Obsidian vaults to GitHub repos to wiki namespaces, and then layering in the concept of decentralization on top of that. Uh, Cosmic, Paul Roney, built a decentralized IPFS-based foundational uh, file system that I don't know that it's ready for prime time, but there's other people who've done the same sort of thing. It's like, hey, here's an alternate distributed file system, often built on top of IPFS, which sort of worries me because once I read about pinning, I was like, ah, oh, crap. Um, and I don't know what the financial model is to reward long, long-term storage of anything uh, on any of these decentralized platforms. And then I can't get into my brain the FedWiki over the promiscuous replication of pages that FedWiki does as a default pisses me off. Like mentally, I don't quite get that. It's like it's forking, any, any page you touch gets forked into your FedWiki. And I don't get why I do that because then I lose where things are. And when things don't have a canonical space, then I feel like if I make any change, it's not actually to the thing I'm yes. trying to change and it'll just fade into the distance, right? And that takes me over to content-based search, which is like, screw URLs, forget them. They were a temporary hack. We should just be able to find our way to the canonical page by mentioning the content, which I don't, and I'm not using. I don't see how it works. I don't know who's solving for that. But, but I'm saying all of this because I kind of need like a rock to stand on to be doing the kind of stuff I'd like to do with other people. And when the rock starts turning, what starts doing a liquefaction thing, I'm like, ah, and I feel like I'm just drowning. Help, I'm drowning. It's, it's kind of a different architectural layer. Um, uh, if, you need, if you need a rock, and, and most people would need a rock to stand on, you're probably, you've, you've got a small number of aggregators that, that made permanent the, the, the decentralized quicksand underneath you. I'm not sure um, I understand how the aggregators do that in any long lasting rock like metaphoric way. Because if the aggr if the little I, aggregators I the, go away, am I hosed? <clears throat> um, not with IPFS. I don't know that IPFS is the right thing. Um, yeah. I mentioned Arweave, which uh, promises to be permanent. Um, it may or may not actually be permanent, but um, but I I think I think you're the I I think what you want is a semantic rock to be able to or a semantic thing to be able to hold on to and an aggregator will give you that mm -hmm. um, for the long term maybe not forever but but for a very long time um in a, in a way in the in kind of the same way that google gives you semantic stability you can always go to google and say uh when was abraham lincoln born and it will tell you so that's a that's a rock which is made upon up on of you know a, a shifting morass of 
I maybe pick a, a more complicated, you know, semantic search, but um, that's the that's kind of what ends up happening. Um, it's it's just that we don't want, you know, we don't want three exactly the same search bots uh, like Google and Bing and whatever whatever the third one is. I don't know if it's DuckDuckGo or Yahoo or whatever. I think though, like. <laughs> It's not exactly that either, right? Like there, because yeah. this obviously builds out a problem for, uh, right, misinformation. There needs to be some sort of understanding of authority. And right now on the web, and maybe we don't want to retain it that way, but right now on the web, the understanding of authority is, you know, page rank, people linking to stuff, um, and the cross links and age of domain. And then down the list, there's more minor factors. I think like there's there's sort of two pieces here, right? One is you need to democratize the methodology by which search pages are created. So I do think like th to answer this problem, you need to have essentially be building towards a, a world where everyone can have their own personal search engine where they can designate sources and they can designate what the the meaning of these things are. That's not Google, right? The problem with Google is not is that you oh, sorry, sorry. for the closure, I am at Google right now. I don't think anybody yeah. is listening, but <laughs> it's fine. It's not like yeah. I'm gonna start this up as a business. I just think like part the problem that we have is that uh right, it can pick up on anything and it's and there's the opportunity to gain. But when you start designating your links that you do want searched and that becomes part of the aggregation process that then becomes part of the search process, then I think that sort of solves the problem. But I think the other thing that solves the problem is there needs to be more of a pattern of like linking in a way that lends authority. I think sort of part of the issue is we reject the idea of linking as giving authority to another page now because it has become too dispersed and there needs to be different methodologies by which we can say i'm not just linking to a page but i am lending authority to this page i think i i I've talked about this before right but i think one of the things that we're missing especially as twitter slowly falls into a fire pit um is like what are the tools of amplification in a post twitter age and like i i, I put this up to my following and like Nobody really has an answer for this. There are no, especially not democratized or at least user-friendly tools of amplification in a post-Twitter age. And the even the tool of amplification that Twitter is, is not useful outside of Twitter, really, right? Twitter, Twitter does not make its best links available for indexing in any way. That's just internal information into Twitter. Um, so I like the idea of like federations or the murmurations, but I do think it has to lend itself towards the idea not of necessarily establishing a piece of content as an authority, um, but more about establishing origins and coordinating inputs. Um, I think a lot about like the schema.org, which is like the the markup for structured data on a web page, right, has a property called is based on that I think is theoretically very powerful. Um, Marc Antoine Perrant has uh, hyper knowledge, which has some of the same um, some of the same characteristics. I there's an old standard uh, that that people were working on in the blogging days or the RSS days, or maybe the microformats days where there was link annotation. Um, like, uh, like, you know, I, I, um, I vouch for this link or something like that. I, I forget what it was. Uh, this, uh, everything you're saying is very interesting. I just have wanted to point out that uh, that's one way of going at it, as I see it, which is like, you know, uh, uh, what the link level, web standards, and, and we should definitely pursue that. But just for the issue of like, uh, you know, maybe this, uh, you know, countering the enclosure of the search or social commons, 
I think there's also like more user oriented ways in the sense of, uh, you know, like essentially like search for example is only useful and, and learns as well from uh, uh, nowadays uh, from the actual use. Like, you know, a user search for something, they find something and at some point they stop searching. So you can sort of infer maybe they found what they wanted, right? And, and that's, you can do that uh, as users navigate a graph. In general, that uh, applies also to Twitter as they cover content people, regardless of whether the actual platform or web pages uh, are like standards compliant, right? So just to say, if a user, if a set of users were able to, we're willing to say, I am going to contribute my search 